Uh, thank you for coming down, even though it's a Friday evening. So let me just get started. Uh, so firstly, I'll address the question, uh, most of the questions that we've got done over the uh, student life fair recently. And to do that, let's, let me first go through the first question that we got, which is what's the difference between NUS hackers and NUS hacks? Because it seems like both of us do hacking, right? So yes, but we follow different definitions of hacking. So maybe when you think of, when you hear the term hacking, you might think of someone in a hoodie, uh, hunch over at a laptop, typing very furiously away at many terminals with a lot of glowing text all over. And that, that is the definition of hacking nowadays. But this isn't the definition that we at NUS hackers follow. We follow a more traditional definition of hackers back when, back in maybe like 1960s, when the term hacker referred to like hacker culture. And in fact, if you search the term hacker culture on Wikipedia, you actually see this entry, hacker culture, not to be confused with a security hacker. So in a sense, you can say that Great Hat deals more with like a security hacker side of things. And what we do is we try to spread hacker culture. On our side, we define a hacker as someone who strives to solve problems in elegant and ingenuous ways. So on Wikipedia, they define hacker culture as a subculture of individuals who enjoy the intellectual challenge of creatively overcoming limits of software systems to achieve novel and clever outcomes. And this is the hack kind of hacking that we follow. Essentially, we try to make things work in ways that they were meant, never meant to, like we hack to gather things. And what Great Hats does is they hack into things. So that's uh, one of the most frequently asked questions that we got from SLF. And I heard we have answered that. Now with that, let me talk about why we hack. So there's a lot of definitions. And I think for me, this is my personal definition of why hack. It boils down to two things. Number one, because you want to solve a problem and you know that you can hack out a solution to this problem. And number two, simply because it's fun. Uh, let me bring out some examples of hacks or projects that people have done in the past. So I'm sure like almost everyone here, actually can, is anyone here not from NUS or not from NUS currently? Okay, I assume most of the people here are like freshmen or at some point you were in NUS or you kind of know what NUS is, but let me just introduce this project. Uh, this is called NUS Mods. It's a timetable planner that pretty much every NUS student will use to plan their timetable. So this uh, is a student. So NUS Mods actually came from a student. So back in 2011, the existing timetable builders at that point weren't very nice. And some student at some point, Bing, just got frustrated enough that he decided to build his own timetable planner. And that was how NUS mods came about. So since then, uh, different students have started contributing to that project and they came out with a version two. And I believe we are on version three now and version four should be coming out soon. So this is an example of hacking to solve a problem that the timetable planner wasn't good enough at that point. So someone decided, hey, I'm going to solve this problem. Or perhaps another example relevant to NUS uh, is this tool called Fluminous. Uh, it stands for, uh, the S stands for something and the Luminous stands for Luminous. So this is a tool that lets you download files from Luminous with just a single command. So what happened was back then, uh, several years ago, I think in maybe 2016, we weren't using Luminous. Uh, we were using some, we were using this software called IVLE. And IVLE had tools to allow people to download directly from NUS, from IVLE itself. So when, so at some point NUS decided uh, that they are going to build 
the Luminous platform itself. And of course, uh, the tools to download from IVLE stop working. Now, NUS also promised to let us access uh, features so that we could build our own applications to, to replicate those features. But uh, one student who had requested for access to those features just didn't get a response from them after some time. So he got frustrated enough that it's highlighted over here. He decided to reverse engineer the interface used by Luminous and then from there, built his own tool to download from Luminous itself. So that is the origin story of Fluminous. So you probably can guess what the F stands for. And this is another example where someone had a problem with downloading files from, Uni from Luminous and they decided, let's just create a solution for that. And that is the kind of hacking culture that we want to spread in NUS hackers. So we hope to build a community of hackers within and beyond NUS itself. Because hackers do what they want to do out of passion and passion is what drives our field forward. So now let me answer like, what do we do? And firstly, uh, let me answer two questions, two most, of the most frequently asked questions from SLF together actually. Now, firstly, one question that was frequently asked is, how do I join NUS hackers? And I believe this question came about because uh, most other interest groups are recruiting for people to join them during SLF. But for us, we are not really recruiting for you to join our events. We are just, because we don't have a concept of membership, you can just freely come and attend our events. You don't need to sign up on a, you don't need to register on Oxing or whatever. In fact, we, we, our events are open to public. So you don't actually have to sign up on any platform to join our events. So in essence, just by, come, just by attending this talk, you are already a member of NUS Hackers. And there's also no obligation to attend weekly ev events. So you're just, you, you are free to attend whatever interests you. So wherever you have the time to, there's no commitment required. And also the second fr frequently asked question is, what events do NUS hackers run? There's a whole bunch. So for this semester, uh, we, are, we have a Friday Hacks, Hacker Tools, Hacker School, a project intern, and a new pilot project called Project Mentor. And in previous semesters, we have hosted a hackathon called Hack and Grow, um, a gathering called Hack Tuesdays, and a summer open source contribution initiative called Open Hack. So let me elaborate more on the events for this semester as well as hack and roll first. So, so let's first start off with Friday Hacks. Uh, Friday Hacks is a weekly event. In fact, this is the first Friday Hack for the semester where we give talks by all sorts of people. They could be industry professionals, they could be fellow students, they could be uh, academics like SOC profs maybe, or even from overseas. And they'll share on a, top, on a project that they're working on maybe, or some topic that, that they're interested in sharing in. So we used to cater pizza, but for the last semester, we have been hosting things online. So let me just give some examples of events that we have hosted last semester for Friday Hacks. So earlier I mentioned Fluminous. Uh, Julius is the student that built Fluminous. He was an NUS computer science student. He's, he's graduated now, so he's alumni. So this is Julius sharing on the process that he took to reverse engineer how Luminous locks you in and lets you download files, and then how he managed to come up with the tool itself. So, here's an, so this is an example of a student project. Uh, here's another example. Uh, this is William Bird. Uh, he's a researcher from Alabama. And this is his research. Uh, it's, a, it's a relational programming language called Mini Kendron that can be embedded in other programming languages. And from there, after embedding that, you can use Mini Kendron to do relational programming in languages that don't directly support relational programming. So this is an ex example of an academic sharing their research. And here's another programming language example. Uh, this is Yukiro Matsumoto. 
Uh, he's the creator of a popular programming language called Ruby. So this is him sharing on his thoughts on the future of Ruby, beyond Ruby 3.0, after he released Ruby 3.0 last year during Christmas. And this is another example. This is by an industry professional. This is Eugene from UILicious sharing his advice on junior on how junior developers should uh, approach, should deal with, should ex what junior developers can expect and prepare after they just get hired. So although this talk was uh, targeted at junior developers, uh, I felt that it was also very the advice shared there was also very relevant to interns or people who are just getting their first internship and whatnot. So we have covered several examples. We have industry professionals, we have students, we have like researchers and whatnot. And as you can see, there's really quite a variety. Uh, and this variety is intentional because we want you to see that all, all kinds of things that people are doing out there. We want you to see what your peers are doing. We want you to see what uh, is going on in the industry. We want you to see what what are like computer science problems people are working on nowadays. So as you can expect, the difficulty of, well, uh, the, the content of the shared at Friday hacks really varies. So sometimes it might be a little harder to follow. And sometimes it might just be something that you have been looking forward to all the time. Uh, as an example, like uh, William Bird's talk for me was, this was a topic that I've briefly heard of and not touched, but never really dove into. So when he gave this talk, it was a little tricky for me to follow, but I, I learned a lot. Uh, I learned a lot about what relational programming can do by following along this talk. So the point that I'm trying to get across is Friday Hex has a huge variety of talks, and sometimes they may not be something that you are immediately interested in, but that's fine because you can just attend whatever you, you whatever catches your interest. There's no commitment. So now with the easing of measures and hopefully it will continue that way, we are hoping we can go back to face-to-face -to -face Friday hacks where you can get around with other people who are just as interested in a topic as you and you can just sit together and maybe discuss with people. And may occasionally you get to hang out with the speakers themselves. So uh, this is John, he's the maintainer of a popular video editing so so uh, video player called VLC. You probably have heard of it. This was him just hanging out with the core team and some other members who attended his talk afterwards. And of course, we provide pizza at every Friday hack. Well, face-to-face -face ones anyway. So it's really nice to be able to just chat with people who are interested in some topic with, oh, just over some pizza. So we hope to host more of these events, face-to-face -face Friday hacks in the future. So here's a sneak peek of upcoming Friday hacks. So for this semester, we have uh, arranged a whole bunch of get to know your profs. So you have several profs speaking. Uh, here are the confirmed ones. Uh, Prof Oi, he teaches CS2030. Prof Martin Hens, he teaches CS1101S. Uh, Prof Elias Sergey. Hmm, I think he I think he's a UNUS prof who teaches programming languages. And Prof Seth Gilbert, uh, algorithms prof, and Prof Gary Tan. So I won't review the talks they have planned yet, and some of them haven't confirmed it yet, but it's mostly topics personal to them. And it's a good opportunity to ask them questions as well. So another talk we have scheduled is uh, live streaming at scale. This should be an industry talk. Uh, building in public, which is the next talk actually. And also uh, talk by the NUS Mods maintainers, and uh, how it works and what are the future plans for it and many more. So if you're interested, here, follow our channels. We'll announce the talks as they come out. Yep. And so the next series of events that we organize is called Hacker Tools. Uh, this is a series of workshops that cover skills essential to computing, but are not taught directly in school. 
And we teach this because they are useful tools, but you don't really get a formal course on such tools all the time. For example, uh, using virtual machines, uh, installing an operating system, getting proficient at using the command line, wrangling data in the command line, text editors, uh, LaTeX, which is a typesetting tool used to generate uh, nicely formatted PDFs and whatnot. So we usually host these events on Tuesdays uh, in the evening on Zoom. Uh, there might be some that are not on Tuesday for this semester, but we'll let you know. So here's an example. Uh, this was one of our members giving, showing how you can access, you can use the tool SSH to re remotely access another computer. So these are the kind of things that we cover in Hacker Tools, which you, you will be using probably at some point. In fact, I think, yeah, just for as SSH as an example, you'll probably be using this in modules like CS2030. And your TS will probably briefly cover it, but we get the opportunity to go into a little more detail about what, what each command is doing over here. So for Hacker Tools, if you're interested, uh, here are some upcoming events we have lined up. We have uh, virtual machines where we'll also walk through installing Ubuntu, the standard shell and, script, and shell scripting, uh, data wrangling in the command line, LaTeX, um, Emacs, Oh, and Vim. And also one of our members is going through the Linux internals. So the internals of the Linux kernel, if anyone's interested in that. Yeah, so now at this point, you might think I'm new to coding. Can I join your events? Because it seems like uh, hacker tools is very much uh, very to hacker or Friday hack seems to have a really really diverse range of topics. So the answer is yes. We have an event called, we have a series of workshops called Hacker School, where we teach introductory content to a particular topic. For example, uh, the Python programming language, simple automation using uh, Python, uh, HTML, CSS, version control software like Git, how to write your Telegram bot, how to do mobile development, how to do, how to do web development and whatnot. So if you, you are interested in hacking, but you, you feel that you are a beginner and you, you wish, wish to learn more, this is the perfect series of workshops for you. So we usually host this on Saturdays in the morning. And well, this was a face-to-face -face event where you would bring your laptop down and then work along the project. Uh, this was a Telegram bot workshop. So the participants built a Telegram bot, bot, bot over the two hours there. So for Hacker School, if you're interested in attending some of the workshops, uh, here's some events we have lined up for the coming semester. This introduction to programming in Python, which will actually be the next Hacker School that we're coming up with. It's next Saturday, I believe. Uh, Azim, is it the next Saturday? Yep, it's going to be on the 21st. 21st. Okay. Uh, automation with Python. That would be a fun one. Building Telegram bots, which has historically been our most popular workshop. Uh, data processing and visualization with Python again. Um, we're actually doing this in collaboration with SDS, uh, Stats and Data Science Society. So we'll be hosting their speakers who will be giving this workshop. Uh, building your own website, so HTML, CSS, and whatnot. So these are really like uh, introductory workshops where we just, we, we don't assume any knowledge. And if we do, we state it clear what's the assumed knowledge in that workshop. So if you are completely new to this, like you have never even heard of what HTML is or what a Telegram bot is, these are the kind of workshops that you probably want to check out. And it's just enough for you to touch on the topic and you can go and work on your own project afterwards. So that's Hacker School. And on now we get to Hack and Roll, which is our flagship event. This is our, this is a 24 hour hackathon. Uh, it's the largest student run hackathon in Singapore. And especially, no, well, one thing that I really like about this hackathon is we don't set challenges or topics, meaning we don't have a particular sponsor saying, 
this is a problem in a, this domain and we would like you to come up with a solution to that. So you're really free to build on whatever you want with whatever technology you want. So we traditionally host this at the start of the year. So Hack and Roll 2021 has been over. Uh, it's not necessarily every January, sometimes it might be early February, and we are still working on our plans on Hack and Roll 2022. So stay tuned for that. So Hack and Roll 2021 was hosted online over Discord. And let me go through some of, because as I mentioned, we don't have a set challenge or topic, but we do have several uh, price categories that you can aim for. So let me go through some of the winning entries from 2021 in some of the winning entries in Hack and Roll 2021. So this was one of the top eight entries. It's a little mini game where called Save Entry Please, where you have to quickly look at look at what the what the, the person over here is holding up and see whether it's a valid safe entry token that can be accepted. So this was one of the top eight. Uh, this, was, this is called meetups. It's also one of the top eight. Uh, what it does is it lets you import multiple schedules into, into NUS mods, for example. So it's kind of small. You can't really see the words, but each of these color represents one person's timetables. And it lets you import multiple timetables into one giant timetable, one giant uh, weekly, weekly outline, and then you can schedule your modules to do with your friends together. Uh, this was the winner of the most annoying hack. It's called Shake It Off. So the problem they had was they keep shaking their legs. So they'll come up with an app that just annoys them when they shake their legs. So you shake it off. Uh, this is the winner of the most beautiful hack award. So it's titled Markdown Font. So uh, uh, the text at the top and the bottom are the same, but the bottom renders differently following like Markdown. Markdown is a markup language. Markdown is a markup language where you, you are able to mark up the content. So you can see like based on what he's typing, it's rendered differently. Uh, let's wait for an example. Uh, okay, with two stars, it becomes italics. Three stars, it becomes bolded. And it's actually the same text, but it's just rendered differently because of how it's done. So this was the winner of the Most Beautiful Hack Award. Uh, this was another category, Most Socially Useful, uh, basically an OCR desktop app. So th these were just some of the winning entries that I highlighted. So if you're actually part of the winning teams and I didn't, <laughs> and you're in this call now and I didn't bring out your project, please don't take it personally. I just grabbed some of the projects that I found from the winning entries on our website. So these are some, these were the prizes that we gave last year and also the price categories. So most socially useful, we covered uh, yes, most awesomely useless, best hardware hack and whatnot. So this was Hack and Roll, I, think, I believe 2020, where it was a physical event held on NUS at the Cinnamon Tembusu Dining Hall. And this is one of the highlights of NUS for me. Uh, particularly this, uh, this is our midnight surprise where we give out all the sponsors sweat uh, at midnight. So you can kind of see the queue sneaking along and everyone's just queuing for the swag. And we also cater in my opinion, really good food. So if you are interested in participating in Hack and Roll with your friends, do keep an eye out. And now let me cover another event, uh, another event that we host. Uh, this is called Project Intern. So what we do is we get, we get a lot of uh, seniors who to give advice on internships about why you, why you should be applying for internships, how you can interview for an internship, how you should be up, how you should select companies to apply for an internship depending on what you're interested in, uh, what to do when you have an in, in, what to do when you have secured an internship, and how to best perform in an internship. So we also conduct things like, and on along that line, we conduct things like mock interviews to prep you for uh, your interview inter your internship interview, uh, career advisory. For, so 
let's say you're, inter you're interested in pursuing a career along the lines of uh, artificial intelligence and you're looking for someone who's already uh, working full-time in that domain and you would like career advice from them, we can get seniors to provide that for you. So uh, this, the next Friday hack, Friday hack, I, okay, the number here is wrong, I think it's 205. We are actually hosting a project intern discussion panel. So we'll have two parts to this discussion. The first is when we get uh, see your seniors who have interned, who have done internships for, at companies, for example, like, like Facebook, Google, Stripe, uh, startups or, and whatnot. And they give their advice on internships. And the second part where you get, uh, you join a breakout room and you get to ask questions uh, that directed at someone who's more knowledgeable in a particular field. So if you're interested in that, keep an eye out for the next Friday hacks. It will be next week, I believe. Yes, is that the case, Jibesh? Oh, yep. The project in June Friday hacks is next week, uh, same time. Yep. And now, uh, okay, back to the topic of you're new to hacking and you want to get, but you want to get started. So this semester we are launching a pilot program called, well, uh, I call it NUS Hackers Peer Mentorship. So what we do is uh, we try to match you up with a student or alumni who will mentor you in hacking. Uh, it will be a semester long program. And on top of hacking, of course, uh, I'm sure they'll be happy to answer academic related matters like, for example, planning your four, maybe a four-year timetable for you or something. Now, this is still in the pilot phase. We are still confirming some details with our profs. So stay tuned to our publicity channels if you're interested in signing up for this peer mentorship program. So our main publicity channel is Telegram. Uh, on the left, this is a telegram, our Telegram channel. So if you just want to get subscribed to the events as the details of the events as they are, they are being published, then you can just follow this channel. And we also have a Telegram group where we, along with the details that we publish, you can chat on different topics. So the way this chat works is, it's like, it's kind of like an IRC. You, can discuss anything as long as it's just tech related. So it's possible that there might be multiple discussions going on at the same time. So uh, don't be alarmed by it. It's just the nature of a large telegram group that allows open-ended discussion, I guess. Yeah, I'll leave this on for a while more and maybe come back to it later. Yeah. And now we come to the last most frequently asked question. How do I join the NUS Hackers core team? So uh, the NUS Hackers core team is a bunch of students that organize all these events, Friday Hacks, Hack, hack and Roll, Project Intern, one on one on. And if you're interested in being part of the organizing team and you are passionate about our mission, you want to help us spread hacker culture, then we want you, we want, we invite you to apply to join for our core team at this link. So if you're interested in being part of the organization, com organizing committee, you want, and you have ideas on how we should organize things. You have ideas on what kind of events that we should be organizing. Then please apply to us. And with that, I believe we have come to the end of Welcome Tea. Uh, there will be a Q&A later, but in the meantime, let me just introduce, briefly introduce the next talk, Building in Public. So we have a sharing by Jetro Kwan. He's currently a machine learning engineer at ByteDance. And he'll, he'll be sharing on how hacking has, well, maybe he won't agree on this, how hacking has changed in life, his life, why and how you should do it and things you should watch out for. So I'll let Jetro handle the details of his talk himself. But in the meantime, uh, uh, if anyone has any questions and, and if you are comfortable with it, you can unmute yourself and just ask it directly. Or alternatively, it, you can post it in the chat 
and we will answer it from there. So I'll look, I'll stop sharing for now and I'll answer questions in the chat if any. Yes, yes, you are all hackers now. Can I just go eat pizza? Okay, let me propose to you what, what was in the slide. Come for the pizza, stay for the inspiration. Uh, someone PM me, when has go? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> 21st August, yes, 21st August should be in the morning. Yes, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Ah, that's already answered. Okay, publicity channels. Joining core team must be year two, year of matriculation. No, in fact, if you are year one, yeah, if you are in year one, sem one now, we invite you to apply for core team. We really want, as, as long as you are really passionate about our project, about our mission, and you, you believe in the kind of community that we are trying to build here, please come and apply to us. Uh, is NUS mods managed by you guys? No, NUS mods is not, man, uh, it's not managed by NUS hackers, but several of the core team, well, the core developers of NUS mods, or rather the maintainers uh, have been in NUS hackers. So two of them, graduated recently, Li Kai and Yi Liang. They were, the, they were two of the three core maintainers for, for NUS mods for a long time. And one of our members, Christopher, is also one of the maintainers of NUS mods now. Chris, you are, you are, right? You are a maintainer yes. of NUS mods now. I am, and yeah, NUS mods yeah. isn't really linked to NUS hackers, but we are close friends and we work together to like, organize talks and organize events. Yep, so stay tuned for the um, Friday Hacks talk about, N about NUS mods and what's next for NUS mods. Yep. Okay, uh, is it? Yeah, if anyone has any questions, yeah, feel free to ask them. This welcome tea took a little longer than I expected. So I think I'll, I'll leave it up for questions for another two minutes. And meanwhile, we'll just awkwardly stare at each other over Zoom. Okay, let me share my screen so you don't have to stare at my face. And yes, can we join the core team in year two if you want to relax in year one? Yes, you can, uh, but... Hmm. Okay, one thing that I didn't mention earlier is that Unlike most other interest groups, which have a concept of like a committee and they rotate yearly, most of the time, NUS hackers, mem core team members stick to NUS hackers for, the entire, for their entire duration at NUS. So as an example, I joined NUS hackers in year one, sem one, I'm year three now, and I have been with NUS hackers all this time. So you can, but uh, to ensure that we have a healthy supply of, to ensure that we really have enough people at the, in the core team at any given time to run all other events that we conduct, because it's really quite a bit, and we are a really small team. We we have to factor in your graduation time, well, well your graduation date. Uh, yeah. So, yeah, but in fact, like, advice to be if you are really interested in spreading hacker culture, why not just consider like joining, uh, as 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 early as you can, so that you can, um, see how the events are being run and like uh, be more in touch with the team. So I would say, um, I'll encourage you to apply early if you're interested. But if you really want to defer your application to like when you are, um, later in your school years, um, that's fine as well. But like what Jingyan mentioned, we do uh, consider how long. Um, it takes for you to graduate. So like, for example, if um, you will only be in the core team for like a year, then we'll say that your chances of getting the core team would be um, 
lower because like you won't be spending that much time in core team as well. So yeah, I hope that gives you an idea. Yeah. Okay. So Brandon, there's not something like do so Brandon asked, do we like go skim through the GitHub of many open source projects such as OBS, LibreOffice, GIMP? Actually, I think OBS is the only one that's actually on GitHub. LibreOffice and GIMP is on GitLab. LibreOffice should be on GitLab as well. So uh, we don't do that currently, but if you feel like this is something we should do, then suggest it to us. We'll, yeah, suggest it to us. We'll take into consideration and we'll host it if we find that there's value to doing, like, doing this for our members. Um, yeah, and I just want to is... add on to the point that is just mentioned by Ting Yen. So I think he raised a very good point that you actually don't have to be in the core team if you want to like organize events because what we do here as a club is we want to support hackers. So even if you are not in the core team and you have great ideas, you want to organize events, you want to give a talk, you want to teach a workshop, just link up with us. We'll try to find out ways to support you. And um, yeah, so there, there really isn't any like... Um, requirement for you to join the core team for you to like have an impact on hacker culture because us here in the NUS hackers core team we will help you to facilitate that yep okay uh i see several more questions okay uh Jian Feng, uh some members have answered your question but i just want to elaborate on it more yes very much yes because in fact most of the events that we host are for you to gain experience because like how, how do you become an experienced hacker? By hacking. And all these events are opportunities for you to hack. So yes, definitely, yes, you can join all these events. Now, some of them, like Friday Hacks talks, some occasionally may be harder to follow along. But in fact, I think there's still value in going for talks that you completely blow your mind because at least you know like there, there are things going up. There are things like being covered out there in the world that you didn't know about, right? Uh, who is maintaining NUS mirrors? So, um, okay, if you're interested in NUS mirrors, uh, uh, you can send an email to me afterwards, Jingyan at nushackers.org. So I don't, be, I don't think anyone is maintaining NUS mirrors at the moment. Uh, the last maintainers have all stepped down. Uh, send an email to me, I'll link you up with the prof who is in charge. Uh, how is the workload like being in core team in terms of hours committed per week? So typically one core team member is in charge of one of these events that we mentioned over semester. So it depends on the event that they are in charge of. And uh, we rotate responsibilities. So for example, if we know someone is going to overload in the coming semester and that uh, if a member tells us that they're going to be very busy the next semester, then uh, we, give that, we give that member less work to do. So I think that's one of the benefits of core team being very small because it's very easy to shuffle work around. Uh, okay. Yeah, okay. I don't see any more questions for now. Okay, and it's 7.44. Okay, uh, I think we can have a Jivesh. Do you think we can have a five minute break before oh. we proceed to Jetro's talk? Sure. Yeah, you guys can uh, take a break with discussion or something. Um, yeah, that's, that's completely fine. Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm looking forward to Jethro's talk. <laughs> okay. I'm very excited <laughs> for you to do come around today. Yeah, so guys, don't leave the call. Come back in like around five minutes time and we'll have a great sharing by Jethro about building in public. Right, so yeah, we are, we'll stop for now. Have a short five-minute break. Thank you, Jingyan. Yeah. Okay, and once again, thanks for everyone for coming down even on a Friday evening. <laughs> and... You should also put the stuff you built um, in public. Then the uh, second goal is to introduce some um, potentially useful tips that you could use and, and software you could use for school. Yeah. So um, like Singhai mentioned earlier, uh, one of the like, main reasons you should build things is because it's fun. I mean, um, like if you're going to uh, computer science, when you graduate, your job isn't going to veer far from like 
like building things. Like even as a machine learning engineer, uh, I do a lot of systems building, uh, building um like backends and stuff like that. So if you don't enjoy it, and then it's just gonna be really painful for you, uh, like once you graduate. So like, it it, it should be fun. So you should you should enjoy it, and and it's also really helpful. So like uh, I remember um. When I was in year one, uh, I applied for an internship at Carousel. Uh, and in year one, I hadn't yet completed my algorithms course. So they gave me some algorithms questions that I, I couldn't do. And I remember being so like devastated that uh, when the interview was over, um, I followed the interviewer out and thinking that it was the exit, it was actually the toilet. <laughs> so, so that was like quite quite memorable. But, but the interviewers gave me uh, some chance because they recognize that uh there were that I, I built some stuff before and they can tell that um like I do have experience building things and can contribute as an intern. So it's, it's also gonna be very helpful for finding internships. Yeah. Uh I mean the second reason you should build is to scratch your own interest. And I'm gonna give a couple of examples of stuff I've done. Uh so Yeah, um, so uh, one of the stuff I built, uh, I called very unimaginatively a uh, guitar. Uh, it's like Chinese for guitar. So um, I recently started picking up the guitar a couple of months ago. And I, I really like to play like uh, like random songs I uh, listen to on Spotify. So uh, the, the problem is every time I want to play a song, I need to go look it up, uh, look up the chords on uh, like ultimateguitar.com. So I built a very simple tool for me to uh, like which which fetches the current song playing on Spotify, uh, scripts the most popular tab there is on the on the website. Uh, it's actually not not very legal, but it's done. Um. So uh, and then uh, it also auto scrolls based on the song time. So I can start like playing songs uh hands free. I just load up this website and uh play a song on uh, Spotify and just like jam along to it. So this is something that I have built uh in about like a, a day or two and uh, I continue to use it every day. And then uh, like I also build off like small uh, things to sort of validate ideas. So one of the questions that I used to have was that uh, can I have my system surface me relevant information? So for example, uh, I'll be looking at um, like some of my notes on uh, statistics and then like, like a module like let's say SD2131. And then can you show me um, my emails regarding 2131 or like any anything that's relevant? So I built like a toy implementation of this uh, in Emacs, which is like my editor and operating system of choice uh, using recall, um, which is a desktop full text search tool. So over here, uh, the GIF shows like the, the right hand, the right, the pane on the right shows uh, the search for like the text around the cursor uh, of my of my cursor in the in the left pane. Uh, it, like it, it just ended up not being very good because uh, the results were very noisy. So like, but this was just like a two, three hour experiment. And then uh, finally, uh, like one of the questions I, I asked myself during school was like, how can I best remember what I've just read? Because computer science, they, they teach you a lot of stuff. And um, like most of the time, like af after the module is complete, I forget what I've learned. And then it comes back to bite me in the ass. So for example, uh, if I'm taking like, uh, like the theory of deep learning, uh, which is a uh, like a CS5K module. Uh, I need to know my algebra, uh, linear algebra inside out, and my statistics inside out. But this is like stuff that I've like completed a long time ago and I've forgotten. So um, there's this guy called uh, Andy Matuschuk, um, who's really into this thing like augmented intelligence stuff. So um, his suggestion is to transform the material into some sort of reading comprehension task. And it gives some ideas in this link on how to use space repetition for that. Um, so like to me, space repetition is something like, like exercise is, is good for you, but you don't really want to do it. And, and it's really tedious to create cards. And like, like right now, the, the most popular solution is Anki. And then you have to go in, load up the app, uh, create the cards and, and just like do that for every single uh, module, which is really exhausting. So uh, I built a little tool for myself to create cards for anything I've read. So, um, so the first step is to obviously um, create the cards. Um, so I piggybacked off this tool called uh, Hypothesis. 
which is a tool that lets you annotate any, anything on the web, including uh, PDFs. So here uh, are some of the annotations I've made on this PDF. And then the, the second step is to just implement a very simple space repetition algorithm. It's not very difficult. And then the, the third step is to just actually like just use the tool. So this is also something that uh, I created in, in about two or three days and then uh, like found it really useful. Yeah, so um, like these are just like small projects you can do to like scratch your own itch. I, I think it's a very useful practice to have. Um, and hopefully like the projects ben uh, improve the quality of your own life. Um, and like finally, um, you, you, can, you can also build stuff to learn. So uh, like the original imp implementation of uh, my um, like the guitar karaoke app was uh, to clone Shazam itself. So uh, basically what it did was it, it uh, record, uh, it recorded a um, seven second clip uh, of what's playing on the, in the background and it tries to match it against uh, like an audio database. Um, so this basically is just a clone of Shazam, uh, but it was quite clearly overkill and but it was interesting. Like I learned how uh, stuff like uh, how audio fingerprinting works, how, how Shazam works and, and it, it was quite a learning experience. Uh. Yeah. And then, uh, I mean, you of course, you also learn like essential dev skills. So you learn how to use uh, different web frameworks, like uh, your web framework of choice, like React or Angular. You learn how to deploy um, the apps that you have built. You learn how to uh, use version control, how to scope and iterate on your product. These are all like essential skills that you 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 can learn and apply uh, uh, eventually when you graduate or, or in your internships. Yeah, and and the more the more you build things, uh, the easier it gets. So like I remember like the earlier projects that I built, uh, I think it was almost uh, it was the year where Singapore had really bad days, and then I built like a website to show the to the scripts the NEA uh, NEA website and and uh, post the PSI and then does some predictions on how the the PSI is gonna change over the next few hours. This was like like really poorly written and and um uh, the more the more i build uh the easier um like building things gets so like all these small projects that uh, i just showed you they only just take a day or two and they are very functional so like it's, it's just like the more experience you gain uh the the better and then uh, last but not least uh when you build and you put things out there uh like you you create opportunities so some good things can happen and then um this is just the story of like one of my projects that sort of uh, uh got a bit viral uh and became quite popular so uh, first some background um so my tools of choice are, are emacs and org mode uh i'll explain these two in a while um so I started using Emacs uh, sometime right before school started. So it's about six or seven, seven years since I've used the tool and I, I haven't looked back since. Um, so Emacs is like an editor that, it's a programmable editor that, that can basically do anything you want. And Alt Mode, it's like, a, it's, you can basically think of it as Markdown on steroids. So actually, um, the previous speaker, Ting Yan, he created this Telegram group for Singapore Emacs users. So if you're interested, you can kind of like join the link via the link. Right. So like Neil Stevenson, who is a science fiction author, he wrote this about Emacs. He says Emacs outshines all other editing software in approximately the same way that the noon day sun does the stars. It is not just bigger and brighter, it simply makes everything else vanish. And I, I feel like this is like really true. Like there is no um, currently no text editor that comes close to what uh, Emacs is capable of. Uh, I use Emacs for reading my email um, and and some of the more like important organizational things that I'll demonstrate to you later on. And then um, the next bit is Org Mode, which is a really old, not really old, maybe like a decade or more old piece of software that's written in Emacs. Or oh, Emacs is actually um, I think more than fifty years old by now. So it's a really old piece of software that's, that's still very relevant. But Ogmo is basically a 
structured plain text markup system, uh, which is kind of like Markdown, but because it's implemented in Emacs and you can program like Emacs provides you with a programming language to manipulate text and amongst other things, uh, all modes powers are kind of like limitless. So um, more the main use cases for OMO is for task management. Um, so school can be quite overwhelming. Uh, and I found that having a system uh, really helps with managing like the school workload. Um, so there's this book by David Allen called Getting Things Done. It's one of the more popular uh, methodologies. So OMO comes with uh, built-in support for like to-do list management, time tracking, and then it, it has plugins for basically everything. So I'm going to give you like just a very short TLDR on what GTD is, uh, but, but if you're really interested in like how you can become more productive, uh, you can go and read the book. So the, the first idea is to have a system that you can rely on completely to capture everything. Um, so you can imagine that you're like doing something and then someone walks in and tells you something and then you don't write it down. So what happens is that you, uh, like your, your brain uh, has like limited RAM. Or limited memory and if you don't write it down if you don't have a system that you external system that you can rely on to capture everything then your brain has to keep track of all these like stuff that you've been told and then you can't you can't use it to like make for maximum efficiency so that's one one tenant of like the system is to have some form of uh, capture system and then um the second is to batch process stuff so uh the batch the the processing, the same processing steps gets done for every single task that comes in. It's just that people tend to do it one by one. And then batch processing, uh, like in CS, it's generally more efficient because you can group tasks together, like related tasks together. So those are the two key tenets of uh, getting things done. So uh, I gave a, I think I gave a very brief introduction to like my system about two or three years back. So it looks something like this. So all the articles, the papers, and anything basically gets captured into like an inbox. And then um, I will process items into the inbox um, by refiling them into like under the various projects. So for example, it could be like a module, or it could be my FYP, or it could be, it could be anything. And then next tasks are, are basically standalone tasks. And then if the, if the um, task in the inbox takes a short while to do, like five minutes, you just do it. Then while working on these tasks, um, you, you sort of like uh, have to store, like capture and store notes. And this goes into my knowledge base. So how it works in Ongmo is something like this. Uh, so you can capture anything, uh, which is just a key away. So it, it adds a new to-do. So for example, if, if like for some random reason, suddenly I, I, I figured that I need to buy some vegetables, I can like just capture the capture the task and it and it goes into my inbox or i can um be looking at a particular article or website and uh, want to read it later so i just use the capture bookmarklet and just store it in my inbox as well and then uh like i mentioned i also read email uh in emacs so uh sometimes i i can read an email but uh decide that i need to reply later and then i can also capture it into my inbox right and then uh, later on um, you want to add like schedules uh, to certain tasks so for example if a task is slated to be done only on a certain day then you schedule it for that day or if it's due by a certain date then you add the deadline and uh, you refile them accordingly so over here uh, I'm adding various tags so for example I added a tag home and school these are the places I can actually perform the task. I also add in um, stuff like um, the, the amount of time I feel I need to complete the task and uh, the priority. And then eventually you end up with like a, with a very like neat um, list of things. So like I break it down over here. So uh, over here you can see the day's agenda. Uh, Today, um, on, on 17 December, I didn't have anything scheduled. So uh, I basically took whatever that I need to do from the project and next task. Uh, you can also clock in like on various tasks. So for example, um, here I've, I clocked in 53 minutes watching this. Uh, I don't remember which um, 
it's, it's one of the US universities uh, lectures. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, so basically, uh, the, the basic idea is that when you need to, when you are free and you want to do something, you can filter based on where you're at. So if you're at home, then you can filter based on tech home, or if you're at school, based on tech school. And then just pick a random task from the list to work on. And that, that really saves uh, a lot of time. So that's uh, using org mode for uh, organization. And then the, the next thing was to use org mode for note taking. Uh, this is particularly useful for I think school uh, because like I, I used it for, for various things so writing my FIP thesis for making my cheat sheets because unlike uh, Markdown, it, it has built-in support for like bibliography, uh, for LaTeX export and for even code execution. So it works like a Jupyter notebook. So this is an example of uh, like my my notes on uh, probabilistic graphical models. Uh, so this like you can even read PDFs inside Emacs. So the PDF is on the side, and uh, I'm taking some notes on the left, and it supports uh, LaTeX preview. And then uh, you can even like export it to a very cheat sheet friendly format. Uh, so this is like a four column cheat sheet for my ST two one three one module that that I wrote in. Uh, Mode. Uh, and you can even give presentations. So uh, this is one of my like one of my friends, she used it to export it to uh, HTML. So she put it up on her website as well as used it to give a presentation to her schoolmates, I believe. Yeah. Or you can also use it to export to like LaTeX Beamer presentation. So this is what I did for my um, Europe, I think. And if something doesn't already exist, you can also go ahead and implement it because uh, Emacs lets you write all like the, the programs. So over here, uh, I implemented a plugin that lets you take a screenshot of an equation and it converts it into the actual um, LaTeX like syntax uh, using a API called MathPix. And then uh, I use this a lot uh, when I was taking notes uh, during lecture. So this lets me take, take notes during lecture uh, at the same speed at which the professor is talking. So I don't have to like, um, like pause to type out the full equation. Yeah, um, so that's note taking. Um, so sometime in my uh, fourth year, uh, I was doing my FIP and my FIP was uh, a combination of Two different fields basically. Uh, I was working on uh, uh, three different fields like robotics, uh, computational neuroscience, and machine learning. So we were thinking about um, how we can um, learn from how the human brain works and, and design better, more efficient um, machine learning algorithms. And this was uh, very challenging for me because I wasn't really good at organizing uh, my research and uh, Around this time, that a book came out by um, this guy called Songke Aaron. I'm sure I butchered his name somehow. But he wrote this book called uh, How to Take Smart Notes, uh, which gained a lot of popularity recently, especially in the Hacker News community. So uh, the book basically uh, describes this method called the Zello Custom Method, um, which was invented by this guy called Nicholas Lerman, who was a German uh, like sociologist, I think who published a total of like 600 articles and 50 books in his lifetime. Uh, and then he attributed all of this to his, um, what he calls his Zetto Custom, which is like his research partner. And the basic idea of the Zetto Custom is that um, you write small atomic notes uh, and then you link between them um, very thoughtfully and extensively. It's kind of like Wikipedia, but your notes have to be really tiny and fit on, uh, for him, it fit on a, like slip cut. So it's a cut they can hold in your hand. And then with this, you can discover sort of like surprising connections between various ideas. And, and what all he did was to arrange his um, notes in a certain fashion and, and like add in additional prose and publish it as a paper. So uh, because of like the rise of the Zero Custom method in the, in the hacker community, um, various tools were created. 
and they are generally referred to as like infinite outliners. So the most popular one was uh, Rome Research, and then uh, more open source alternatives come out like Logseq and Obsidian. So it's it's very surprising because like it's just really just a note taking app, but like um, Rome Research managed to raise uh, I think four or five million dollars without uh, VC funding, which is which is crazy for just like a note taking app. Um, and then someone asked, um, have, has anybody tried um, bringing like the features from this tool uh, into org mode? And I was like, I, I opened Rome Research and I, I just saw this like, uh, I, I thought it was really simple and it was just like 27 lines of code. So I, I wrote it, uh, put it in my configuration and, and used it. But uh, since people asked, I decided to put it out um, in my GitHub repo, in a GitHub repo. And, um, and little, little did I know that it would like, like explode in, into like a, like a thing of its own. So uh, people started um, using it a lot. Uh, people make videos on it. Uh, there are professors who use it to make their lecture notes, uh, scholars who use it to do their research. I also just learned recently this year that it has its own subreddit with like 700 members. And there's of course like, like the usual um, forums for discussing like how to use the software. So it, it has gotten really big. Uh, and I guess I'll give you a demo now. So, uh, so everything in Emacs is sort of like keyboard oriented. So I usually just use this to, um, so this is a list of all my notes uh, that have accumulated over the years. So over the four or five years. Uh, so the, the later notes are notes on uh, different papers that I've read. And then you can, for example, see the note that, uh, that we used for, uh, that I used for my SD2131 module. So you can do stuff like a preview, like the LaTeX um, within the section, stuff like that, uh, or like export it into various formats. So it supports like LaTeX, HTML, uh, like, uh, Review JS HTML presentation and so on. So, for example, if I, oops, I export it to LaTeX uh, with the default template, um, it look like this, which is really pretty neat. So, like you can use this uh, for your own revision, for example. Um, but then the the org room tool basically uh, lets you see what nodes uh, links to, links to this node. So uh, yes, this additional buffer that shows uh, what they call backlinks. So uh, for example, the exponential family node links to this particular node. So you can go there and see. Uh, and then you see that Bayesian inference links to exponential family. And then th the whole idea is to have like a sort of like graph of your nodes and be able to traverse between the different links. Uh, so uh, there, um, so I guess I'll show you a more visual way of like looking through notes. So, so if I, oops. So for example, if I'm on my, like on this note, exponential family, it shows me like the notes that um, it's currently linked to. And uh, let's zoom out for a moment. So this is how, how my entire like node database looks like. Um, so for example, uh, for my FYP, I was working on spiking neural networks, and these are all the like citations that that are relevant to this particular uh, topic. And then I can sort of explore um, what nodes uh, this this spiking neural networks link to. So for example, uh, spectrum, I can go to the node um, here, or I can show. Uh, the additional like links. So for example, uh, like this how spiking neural networks is linked to uh, information bottleneck, which is, I, I'm not sure, I don't think anyone you will get it, but it's like, it's, it's a machine learning thing. So there's also stuff like, uh, like quantization uh, and machine learning. So basically, you have, you have a way to visually explore uh, some of the notes that you have taken down, and this can be very useful uh, during your research if you ever um, go down that path. Yeah. So the the cool thing is that like I actually 
like this is not written by me like this software um so all i've all i've re written was like the the key bindings here to insert notes so for example i can insert a note to computer vision here and it will be linked from let me see it'll be linked from uh spike tree image information and, and like the graph will get updated I, I only wrote this portion but all the other like site stuff um like this uh, visualization tool it's all written by other people um hacking and building on things that i've built so like the great thing about building this in public was that uh, like i gained access to all these tools that wouldn't otherwise be available yeah uh so that's kind of like the tool So um, I mean, like a lot of people ask um, ask me if it's a lot of work, and and the truth is, it it is like like I think most open source maintainers at some point in time will like face some sort of burnout. So this this is my GitHub contribution graph uh, over the the past two years. So as, as you can see, in twenty twenty, uh, I was pretty consistent. Um, basically, almost working on it like every day, small bug fixes. Uh, um, implementing some new features, some spurts of like implementation over here. But then towards the end of like December when the project grew very big, um, uh, there was a point where I, I could no longer keep up with like the like the growth of the project. So I'm, I'm like I was a sole maintainer and like the tool already did more than like everything I needed it to. So uh, over the years I've been merging features from various people and they interacted very poorly with each other. And then sometime in December, I was like, ah, shit, I need to rewrite this for sure. So I, I took a break. Um, so you can see here uh, in like January to like sometime in July, uh, I, I didn't contribute to the repo anymore. Uh, I just left it as it is um, and, and started a rewrite. So this was a rewrite that sort of like removed a lot of stuff. That, that I didn't that I didn't use and I felt wasn't very useful and it sort of allowed me to continue maintaining the repo. So is this kind of things that you you learn like you learn how to scope the project so that you are able to um, be responsible for it. Um, yeah, and then of course uh, like there are tons of people in the community that are really helpful. So there are, there are people who help me answer questions on the forum. Uh, they write documentation. So there's like a whole unofficial documentation written by someone else. Uh, and now there's also another co-maintainer that stepped up that, to relieve my burden. So like, it's great. Uh, like like the, the open source community is very friendly. Um, and and like the changes were very welcomed by, by the community, even though it took like six months and, and a long six months now in a project. So beyond that, uh, you also get a lot of gratitude. So like there are people who send me emails um, thanking me for the project. Uh, they, they also, um, yeah, and, and you interact with all these like uh, people from all over the world who have uh, very interesting things to say sometimes. So it, it's, it's been really interesting. Uh, you also get to interact with like, like for me, there are um, quite interesting people who kind of reach out to me. So one of them is uh, Kevin Rose, who was the co-founder of Dig, I believe. Uh, yeah, and a couple of more um, prominent people who reached out and, and to talk about the project and, and like uh, how, how to like take notes properly and stuff like that. And um, of course, uh, uh, it's also like nice to receive some beer money from the project. So uh, currently there are quite a few people who sponsor the project uh, and I receive some uh, token amount uh, every month and, and, and it's always nice. Lah. Yeah. So uh, to summarize, I, I want to say that uh, like building things sh uh, should be a habit. Uh, it's, it's supposed to be fun, uh, fulfilling and like if if you're not uh like always be like on the lookout for for stuff for for each of scratch or for for stuff to build and then um for me uh like what really helped me during my school was uh thinking about the meta like how to remember the things uh, i've learned or how to um 
how to better improve my research process. These all um, kind of really helped me throughout my school. So I, I, I hope like the, the tools that I've showed you or like the ideas. So from the books, like uh, getting things done and the Zeto Custom method uh, will be helpful. And finally, uh, I think it's very important to, to have fun in school. So uh, don't forget that. Yeah, thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'm open to them. Please share about Hot Room. How do you find the time for everything? Um, so, I mean, for me, uh, what really like saved a lot of time for me was uh, implementing this like getting things done method. Uh, I was pretty disorganized before, but after that, uh, I just felt like like I didn't have any issue handling like the, the workload and stuff. So there, there was a particular semester, I think, um, where I did both part-time work and had like 40 MCs worth of credits. So uh, this, this, this really helped at, at, at that point in time, yeah. So Jetro, do you have some tips for people who want to get started with hacking? Uh, I mean, start, start small, I guess. Like build, build a very small project. Uh, like really just scope the project very well. Uh, even if the project just has like one function. So for example, like uh, I think a very well scoped project is uh, this like, uh, like Gita app. So you, you can't learn uh basically two things when you build this project the first thing is how to interact with like a like a api and how to understand like api docs from various companies and then the second thing is like how to scrape a website so these are all just like very generic stuff that you can learn from different projects uh, let's see what am i building now uh, i'm not building anything so like right now um, I'm trying to learn the guitar. So after work, I just like play a couple hours of it and and like go to sleep or play some video game. Uh, you're using Doom Emacs. Do you use both Bing key bindings and Emacs key bindings? Or I, I use exclusively um, Emacs key bindings. Uh, I, I was a Vim user um, for five years before I used Emacs. So before I started school, I, I used Vim. And I just feel like the model editing slowed me down quite a bit. Uh, the issue with uh, Emacs key bindings is that some people complain they will get um, this uh, thing they call Emacs pinky where your pinky kind of hurts. But if you remap uh, caps lock and control, uh, you swap caps lock and control, then you're, you should be fine, basically. Uh, how often do I write permanent notes? Uh, Right now, because I'm working, uh, I don't write a lot of notes unless uh, my work entails me, like requires me to read a new paper, then I write notes on that. But uh, because I'm not studying anymore and I'm not, I'm not doing research in school, uh, it's just like not, not very often anymore. Uh, do you configure all your devices with Emacs? Yes. Yeah, so basically, um, like I, I only really use like two or three pieces of software. Like the first is of course the browser and then the second is Emacs. And then I just do everything within Emacs. Uh, have you really been stuck while you are trying to implement your idea but couldn't find a solution? Uh, not really. I haven't been very adventurous in my project. So I think the most adventurous one was uh, um, with like the audio fingerprinting because this was something that uh, I've never, never done before. But it's it's just like learning how to like work through that. It's it's also a skill like how to Google the right things, uh, how to find like um projects that I mean there's there are definitely projects that um like uh like I've done something very similar to you to what you want to do, and then you can look for their code, uh, see whether that inspires anything. How long did it take you to adapt to Emacs from Vim? Uh, about three months. 
three months, three or four months. Yeah. Uh, what keyboard layout do you use, uh, Vora? I don't know if people spell it right. Vora. Uh, coffee of choice. Uh, coffee of choice. I, I don't know. I just drink whatever is available. Enemy of choice. I, I choose not to comment. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so Jetro, another question I have is that I think a lot of us, when we want to get started with projects, we're always lost about like what ideas we can start with to build our projects on. So like, do you have any tips for people to like come up with ideas for their projects? I don't know, it really depends on like the, the own, like your own personal age. So like for me, I, I used to think a lot about like how to be more productive, or how to make better use of my time. So these were the stuff I ended up like building. Uh, and then more recently, like I've been playing the guitar. So like I built something like around the guitar, but I'm sure everyone has their own like hobbies, their own like um, things they are, uh, Things they are passionate about, and then just like, like building it, like around around those things should should help a lot. How can I join your fan club? Uh, my recommendation is is don't. How is Byte Dance? Um, I mean, if you're, if you're interested to know about the company, you can reach out to me in, in person. Uh. But yeah, I mean, like the, the thing is that like, I'm not working on a local product, so uh, uh, I'm, I cannot really share uh, how this, but, but I'm working on like education related Chinese products, so you can kind of guess uh, that it's affected. Uh, hi guys, if there's no more questions, then um, we'll be wrapping up today's Friday Hacks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Jess, for that was a really sick talk. Um, yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's all. Thank, thanks so much, guys, for coming. Um, thanks, Jethro and Tingyan for the talk. Yeah. Um, you guys are free to hang around if... if um, is any more questions but otherwise i'll be ending the meeting in like a minute or so <laughs>